The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. First Century Investors Believe actively targeting Australia's growth engine. High quality growing companies listed on the ASX is the secret to beating the market. Since 1993, every wholesale fund managed by its Australian equities growth team has outperformed the share market over the long term. They believe high quality growing companies can power tax effective, geared, X20 and concentrated portfolios. Thinking about new ways to target Australian share market growth Think first, send your investors. Past performance not indicative of future performance. Net of fees as at August 2024. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I am joined today by Karen Ely, uh, certified money coach, women talking finance. One of them I'm really interested in, in particular because I know nothing at all about uh, money coaching. So uh, you're going to teach me a bit and hopefully uh, uh, anyone that's listening as well. Karen, thank you for joining me. Oh, my pleasure, James. Thanks for having me on the show. And we just said we connected at that uh, at the new other event that was on in in Melbourne as a uh, a little while ago. But you'd come over from Adelaide for it. So there's a few people. I was trying to get a few that were down from Sydney. There's a lot of people that come from from different parts of Australia to over to Melbourne to to come and attend. Yeah, it was um, yeah really great agenda, and and I knew a couple of people there that had come from Adelaide as well. So it wasn't mm. just me, so, which is yeah. great. Yeah, okay, so so maybe let's start with what is money coaching? I you know I see it mentioned about on Instagram and LinkedIn and, and, and different places where I where I find myself from from day to day. But but what is what is money coaching? So money coaching really just helps individuals improve their financial well being, but by addressing their emotional, psychological and behavioural aspects of money. So it's really more focusing on the internal as opposed to financial advisors that are very much looking more at the external side of money management. So money coaching blends neuroscience, life coaching, um, therapy-informed strategies, and then we can move into financial education. And a lot of money coaches will do cash flow or goal setting as well. So okay. it's just a bit different. Yeah. Hmm. What's a, so what's a framework that you would take? So, you know, it's often financial advisors that are listening to this podcast and then we've all got a similar kind of an initial meeting, some type of discovery and, and, and advice is provided along the way. What's a typical schedule or, or framework that you follow? Yeah, great question. So just like financial advisors have an advice process where you do your fact find and gather information, do the statement of advice, uh, money coaches can often have a similar thing. So uh, we will have a first session that will be exploring their money story. So we get them to do an exercise where they spend a couple of hours writing out their entire money story or their their biography, we call that. So that might be their first memory around money, might be pocket money, school banking, getting Christmas money, whatever that is, and then just writing out everything that they remember about it, what emotions came up, what things did they hear their parents or family talk about in regards to money. And so we just go through that through their early years, their teenage years, 20s, 30s, 40s. So that is my first session where they'll go and do that work beforehand and then come in and we'll have a session together and we'll unpack it. We'll actually talk about their story because what we know through the field of psychology and neuroscience is the way that we are with money today as adults was typically formed between the ages of zero and seven. So I want the client to go back and really explore what was money like for you growing up because it's deeply informed how they feel about it, how they think about it, and most importantly, how they behave with it today as an adult. My kids are like right in that sweet spot. My you know, eight, you know, one of my kids, kids are seven and ten. And, and honestly, as you're saying, they're like, I wonder what my kids' money story is that's developed uh, in, in them in, in, in those few years. Yeah. And uh, it is really a combination of what we say to them, what they hear. It's what they see. So what they see 
the parents doing, yeah, but also yeah. the energy as well. So, you know, children don't have fully developed brains until late 20s. Mm-hmm. So early on their brain development, they're just picking up on all sorts of cues. And one of the biggest ones is energy and emotion. So if a child grows up in a home where money, when it's brought up as a topic, is really stressful and there's strain and there's, you know, lots of fear around it, children absorb that. Mm-hmm. And their brain's not fully developed to actually understand what that means. And so they create their own stories about money and what it means to them and what the consequences are. Do you, do you have a background in psychology, like in finance? Or what, what's your story to getting into money coaching? Yeah. So I was a financial advisor for 16 years. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. So, but I was always really curious, even from early on, why people do what they do with money. Yeah. So I did a lot of self-study, read lots of books, and I can share some of those with financial advisors that are interested. And um, yeah, just became really curious about why people do what they do with money. Here we are taking a really rational, logical approach, but I saw so many emotional behaviours driving people's financial decisions. Yeah. So um, yeah, so I studied with uh, the Money Coaching Institute, which is in California. And they share a really helpful framework, just like financial advisors have an advice process. Okay. Deborah Price, the founder of the Money Coaching Institute, has developed a, 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 a coaching framework for taking people through it. So there's four unique sessions that you have with a client, and each session is designed to peel back a layer of their psychology around money. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And, and what's the like? What's the conclusion? What 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 are you working towards with 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 it with a money coaching client so to improve their how they think about it how they feel about it and how they behave with money so clients that will come and work with me will typically have one of the following behaviors they'll be overspending they'll be like yep. Karen I earn really good money I don't know where it goes I'm in my 20s 30s 40s I've got nothing to show for it like what's going on so I work with those people uh, a lot of people have avoidance around money. It's like, yeah, I know I should be doing something with it, but I've just got this real physical aversion to, to dealing with money. And I used to see that as a financial advisor. I was working with a couple that'd be the dominant financial spouse and the other person, I'd be lucky if they'd come to a meeting. Mm. And I mean, I mean, there was one client that I had and I hadn't seen her or met her for 10 years that her spouse had been a client. Yeah. So yeah, we've all, I reckon we've all got clients like that. Like I yeah. one, like a, a second meeting, a like a risk profiling type exercise with with a with a couple the, the, this afternoon. I'm trying to get one member of the couple to even say one word. One of them was clearly dominant. I want to do this and I want to do that. And I want to do the other thing. So, yeah, but what about your partner? What do they want to do too? Yeah, we have all yeah. these relationships. Yeah, that's right. So that avoidance or that aversion, there's a reason why they do that, James. So I help them unpack what is it about money that you find difficult boring, unrelatable. There's a reason why. So I want to help them uncover and unpack that and mm. and heal whatever that is for them. Yeah. So, so there's the avoidance. Then I've got other clients. So quite often people say, oh, people need money coaching because they're really bad with money or they don't have enough. But a lot of the clients that I work with are extremely wealthy. They've got high net worth figures, but they still have huge stress and strain and anxiety around money. They won't spend money. Even though they've got plenty there, you can just show them cash flow projections to say you're never going to run out of money, but they still have a fear around spending it or using it or making decisions around investing it. And there's reasons why. So I help them uncover what they are and move them out of that psychology that's holding them back. I was going to ask you, and you've kind of answered there, I was going to ask you if there were like people the other way around, like when money coaching... To, to my mind, and is that I, I know nothing about it, but but it, it, I, my mind kind of goes to people that are bad with money, mm. for want of a better description. But then, you, but then there's the reverse. There, there's someone that's got bucket loads of it, but but still they're bad in a sense with it because they don't understand how they can spend it and what they can use it for, and they've they've still got their own barriers to to it as well. Yeah, that's right. So. Okay. And then the other people that I help is the uh, couples. So sometimes couples aren't on the same page when it comes to money, whether it be how much risk they want to take, whether one being an income earner and the other one wanting to spend it all. So I work with couples as well to help them get on the same page financially. Or 
have an awareness and some compassion around whatever those behaviors are that they have with money that are challenging you and the relationship, just helping you understand where they've come from and helping support them to shift out of them. Yeah. Was this, you know, maybe before you went through or did the studies that you've done, was, was this something that you were delving into in your world as a financial advisor? Were you spending a bit more time with people in this, maybe in the beginning of the financial advice process to try and understand some of this? Yeah, I was actually, James. And so when I'd have a fact-finding meeting with clients, one of my standard questions was, share with me two or three things that you learnt from your parents about money. Yeah, okay. And I encourage advisors, if they're listening to this and and want to kind of delve a little bit deeper and and do a bit of an emotional fact-find on their clients, just ask them, ask your clients, think about the three most significant money memories you have. And so what I know to be true, James, is that if you can remember something from your childhood, there's a lot of emotion and charge around it. Mm -hmm. So it's deeply impacted some of their patterns and behaviors when it comes to money. So I'm really curious about what they are because they can be the underlying root cause of their financial behaviors now. Where do do people find you so so that I I, I don't imagine someone's typing money coach into into Google, maybe they are, maybe they aren't, and how do, how do people come across you? Yeah, they. Um, I'd say they are more these yeah. days, typing in money coaching. So a lot of the work that I do is trauma-informed. So if people have um, overspending challenges or financial trauma, I tend to come up in Google search rankings yeah, okay. for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and then uh, referrals as well from existing clients, I do a lot of financial well-being talks as well. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, get a few clients through that, and I think the corporates are really leading the space in financial well-being. And yes, we want to give them cash flow, budgeting, investing, but a lot of it comes down to habits and behaviours. Like, so, are you a saver? Are you a spender? And what type of money personality or characteristics do you have there? I'm finding that they're really interested and wanting to share that with their employees. Yeah. And so, are you picking up a bit of work? like a, a, a big corporate will engage you to, to do some presentations and education for their staff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. Okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. What what about advisors kind of getting into the getting into the space? So you, you you were an advisor. Are, are you authorized still anymore or you've you've given that up? I am. I'm still authorized. Oh, yeah. So yeah. So a day a week I do wealth coaching for a digital advice firm. Okay. Yeah. But in my own practice, no, I don't. I'm not licensed. So yep. the, the work that I do, James, doesn't really require having any license because we don't even look at numbers and things like that. It's really around uh, the the beha- habits, the behaviours, the emotions that people feel and sometimes unlearning what they learned growing up. So if they learned that money causes problems because my parents used to always fight about money or uh, I wasn't really good with money or I was told I was bad with money, it's about unlearning and changing those neural pathways, and that's the kind of work that I do with clients mainly. Yeah. Okay. And so, advisors that are finding this this a bit interesting, how can they start to involve some of this in their practice? What can they What can they do to be, become a money coach? Yeah. So, there's a couple of different organisations that you can do training with. So, there's certificates and uh, diplomas that you can do. So, Dr. Brad Klontz, uh, he's a financial psychologist in the US. He has a a financial psychology diploma that Mm -hmm. you can do. Uh, The one that I spoke about earlier, the Money Coaching Institute by Deborah Price in California. She's got a 16-week course. I should say that I do teach that course as well to financial advisors, any financial professionals that want to Mm -hmm. delve more in the the money coaching space. And there's a couple of other ones. There's one in the UK, Catherine Morgan, another one in the US, uh, Kelsa Dickey. So there's quite a few around if you type in Money Coaching Academy or different institutions, you can learn more about them. You really want one that's going to offer you an opportunity to use practice clients and actually go through the process. And I think for advisors that are interested in doing this behavioral money coaching, go and get coached yourself. So go through the process yourself. Uh, It's a really interesting exercise to go through to kind of unpack a little bit about your own money story and why the things you do what you do with yeah, it, it, it seems it seems I don't know if it's like uh, my own kind of biases and stuff getting in, in in my way. It's like I'm supposed to be the financial advisor. I'm supposed to know what's going on. I'm supposed to be good at this kind of stuff. 
to then like open up and tell and share my money story, would be uh, I'm sure you'd see it all the time. There'd be a whole lot of realizations people would go through, and they're like, "Aha! Uh-huh, now I understand why I do something that I do today." It's because they're going to link it back to, to something earlier on. It'd be a great exercise to go through. It is a great exercise, and we want to find the origin or the root cause of that, and say, "Okay, well, now as a grown adult." Do I still want to believe that? Is that still helpful or is it hindering my financial results? I often say that as a financial advisor, I was very much in the headspace. As a money coach, very much in the heart space. So people Mm -hmm. are sharing stuff with you that they may not have even told the most closest people to them. And a lot of those money memories that we have, if there were challenges around that, we've forgotten about them. We've kind of locked them out to protect ourselves. We don't want to think about them. So it is a really vulnerable exercise to go through. And I think it's such a privilege to be able to presence that for a client who, yeah, like that was a really tough thing that happened to you. And as a result, this is why you can or can't do certain things with your finances. And yeah. and let's let's heal that. So you're, so you're not... You're not going you're down. You're not going to to financial advice in in your own business. But but do you think there's there's a there's a model out there for for someone to to do both to yeah have I know some type of engagement and then go to fully fledged financial advice afterwards. Yeah, absolutely, James. So I know of several financial advisors that have done this course yeah. and they integrate it into their advice process. Okay. So rather than doing the fact find straight away. They might do the money bio or some kind of emotional fact find and they'll go through part of the process, really get to understand or know their client on a very different level because I really see our finances and our relationship with it a little bit like an iceberg. So as a financial advisor, we see what's above the water. So we see their income, their assets, our liabilities and the money coach. Uh, the behavioral side of things is what's under the water. So that's the values, what they really believe about money, their um, spending and saving patterns and behaviors. That's kind of all underneath the water. So to be able to offer both, I think, is so valuable for a client. Yeah. It'd, it'd, it'd make for a a, a really in-depth like engagement with, with clients. Mm-hmm. You'd have to really map out. Like how how are you going to charge for for this? You know, do you uh, a, a lot of businesses are kind of built on you now we'll do all of this work and then we'll charge you an an, uh, an SOA fee or, or or something like that? But you'd need to be charging up front for these different bits of work that you're doing. Albeit it's no no statement of advice just yet. Yeah. And I got my mind thinking. Yeah, no, a lot of uh, a lot of financial advisors either do that work or they might integrate parts of it, James. Yeah. So, with the the work and the training that we did, we also learn about eight different money types. So, if you kind of think of it as Myers Briggs for your money, there's eight mm. different money types, and they have certain characteristics and traits. They have advantages about that particular money type, but they've also got challenges as well. So they've got strengths or weaknesses with it. So some financial advisors might just start with that just so they can kind of unpack well, what type of personality or money type am I dealing with? And each one of those, there's certain ways that you want to approach that particular individual based on their leading characteristics and traits when it comes to money. So that can be a really good tool yeah. for advisors to use. Yeah. And, and so is that some type of um, work that the that the prospective client would do beforehand or would, or would that be a like one of the meetings in the process you'd facilitate to get to that outcome, to understand what type of money person they are? So it's really simple. as It's just a, a three-minute quiz that you can take. So oh, there's about right. 20 or 30 different words and uh, the client just clicks on which ones that resonate with them or that are true of them. And so then it puts him into a particular profile. It's, it's typically two to three different money types, and one tends to be more dominant than the other. Yeah. And with the advisor having that knowledge, they are putting themselves in a really good position to be able to engage in the right way that's going to resonate with that particular money type, yeah. which can be really helpful. Yeah, I guess I'm uh, helpful on both fronts. It's, you know, you're, you're not going to then feel like you're beating your head against the wall saying, why doesn't this person understand this thing that I'm trying to explain to them? It's like, well, they don't understand because of they are who, who they are. Yeah, so that's right. A much smoother smoother journey on both sides, I would have thought. Yeah, that's right. So there's two money types that we want to shift people towards. That's the the warrior 
whose most financial advisors are warriors. So they set goals, they've got financial knowledge, good income earners, really sensible and balanced when it comes to money. So we're wanting all of our clients to move there. Other money types are your full money types. So very happy-go-lucky, kind of like live for today, don't worry about the future, not into detail. They're your clients that come say, hey, crypto or whatever, you know, they're just looking at the next quick win. So yes. when you can identify one of those clients, we know that when you're working with them, they don't want all of the detail. You need to make it fun and sexy and exciting for them. Then another money type is the martyr. They're, they put everyone else's needs before their own so if we know that and we say, well, you should not be spending so much money in the kids, you need to be putting away for your retirement or your account-based pension is going to run out if you keep you know, bailing the kids out. If you know that they are a martyr money type, that's just not going to land with them. You've got to approach it in a different way for them. Yeah. To, yeah. yeah. So we can use different strategies with different money types. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's businesses that you're saying that are, that are- – integrating this into their practice somehow sounds like they've probably gone and done the studies themselves and and and, and moving forward but what what about integrating with you or someone else like how how, mm. how are you seeing that working in, in some businesses yeah so we get referrals from financial advisors and it's typically they've um, they've met with a client maybe they've got some money to invest, but they've been sitting on it for two or three years and doing nothing. They just won't take action and they won't implement a financial plan. So they identify that there's other psychology reasons going on here for why they're not doing what what we've recommend, that we've recommended for them. So they'll come and work with me for a couple of months. We'll identify what their real psychology challenges are around that and that'll send them back to the financial advisor. But they're in a very different mindset now and can see what was holding them back. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, get, I get referrals from financial advisors, or sometimes it might be that the advisor can't get the couple to move forward because there's different dynamics playing out there, and we've got so much time as financial advisors in meetings in a certain headspace to can't dive deep into some of these things that need a little bit more sensitivity or compassion around them. So being able to refer out to someone that's very comfortable in those deeper waters uh, can be really helpful. Uh, and then I I can only go so far. So I, I do really focus on the emotions and the behaviours and the psychology. And so I refer a lot of my clients that are ready for financial advice to financial advisors. And the feedback is that the advisors love them. Because they're fully engaged, they don't have any hang-ups. They're like, "Yep, the client's ready to take action." Yep. Are, are there any particular, I don't know, like like signs we can look out for? Triggers, like like you, you know, you, you mentioned before about the person that says, "I'm earning good money, but I've got no idea where where they're where they're spending it." I, don't, I don't know there's certain uh, advice businesses out there that to look to work with clients on tracking where their money's going and using different different tools and things. Um, like is is that someone you would work with or is there, or is there certain certain things we should be looking out for where we're thinking, you know what, maybe the work of a money coach might be helpful here? Yeah, so it, I think it is those things around overspending in, in a really significant way. So you've gone and done a financial plan and they've come back six months later and said, oh, we decided to spend 150000 on a house renovation or buy a new car that they really couldn't afford. It's like, well, what's the – the emotional need that they're trying to meet with that money, there's something going on there. Yeah. So, yeah, it can be those overspending. Uh, it could be, again, around that example where one particular spouse is some real avoidance there or um, they're not taking your advice. So you've got this rational, logical financial plan, but they're not actually actioning it or they want to do something different. And it's about kind of understanding, you know, what's what there's something else going on here. Yeah. And 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 even so far as like you know the, the the process that we follow, and I'm sure a lot of other financial advisors do as well, we'll have some initial phone call with the client, a bit of a screening type exercise, trying to work out can can we or or, or can't we help help someone? Like, do, do you think there's even anything that early on in the process that would we can be looking out for, where we say, no, we probably not a great use of my time and the client's time to even progress through to getting to advice for them not to implement. Is, is this something we can look out for to kind of cut it off right at the beginning and say, you know what, maybe you better go to, to talk to a money coach first? Yeah, so 
As a coach, I'm really focused on language. It's amazing if you actually study and listen to what people are saying. There's so many clues in there, so yeah. you can identify those red flags and say, well, I think you might be a better place before working with me to explore some of these other dynamics that you've got yeah, with money okay. first. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. That, yeah. That and what is this? Like, what is it? What does it cost? Like, how, how, like what it, whether it's your fees or just just in general, what like what does a typical engagement with you or someone else look like? What is it? What might it cost someone? Yeah. So depending on the level of their challenges that they have, I typically work with someone over a three month period, and yep. we'll catch up for six sessions. So I've got four that we go through. It's quite unique. So that's just under three thousand dollars to do that. Other coaches might be a bit cheaper and some a bit more expensive. Um, others do one-off sessions. So whilst I focus very much on the psychology side of things, there are some money coaches that might just do goal setting or cash flow and they might charge something from $200 a session up to four or $500 a session. So, okay. But for the deep work that I do, yeah, it is like a, a big commitment in terms of time and cost to, to go mm. through that. But yep. it's a good investment, I think, if, if you've had some challenges around money and nothing's changing year after year, it kind of identifies it. You're not going to be able to figure it out on your own. Need some help, don't you? So, so, you, so you're rather than – your engagement tends to be rather than just like little pieces of the project, you're, you're, you're doing a, a length of time engagement with them. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So that, that three months tends to be a really good time frame for helping people, one, firstly, identify and uncover the challenges that they have and the root cause or the origin of where they've come from. And then I work with them very hands-on, lots of accountability over that three-month period to help them shift out of that. And I give them therapy-informed strategies. We look at mindset as well as emotional and then some practical things. So just getting them to do small but significant steps when it comes to their money just to change some of their habits and behaviours to create new healthier ones. Yep. Are you, are you pushing – back on them in, in, in a sense of the, the client having to do some kind of work themselves. You mentioned earlier on about the, the, the kind of their money story that they're writing out and uh, do they share that with you before they come in to, come in to see you or, or do they give it to you at the time? And, and, then, and then is there other things that they're doing without being in a meeting with you or, or from then on is everything done at the same time with you? No, I do give them work to do in between those sessions. So we'll either, if they want to do it really intensely, we'll do it every week. Otherwise, we'll catch up fortnightly. And yeah. so for those sessions, there's a high expectation that a lot of work will be done on their own, but I'll be giving them all of the tools and the frameworks and exercises to do. So with that initial exercise that I get them to do, that money um, story or the, or the money bio, they do that. That might take a couple of hours to do. And then they'll send that back to me before our first session. And then what I do is I read the whole story and without fail, James, I will see certain themes playing out in their teenage years, their 20s, their 30s, their 40s. Yeah, they just repeat sure. over and over again. History repeats itself. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's like in financial advice when you've been doing it for long enough, like we we just kind of rush to the answers. We tend to most financial advisors anyway, but but you can see someone's profile. They'll fill in a, a in a, a basic fact find before you initially meet, and you're like, I can already see what you need to do. Like, why can't you see this yourself? I'm sure you would you you see the same thing when you're reading those money bios from people. Oh, absolutely. But it's not my job to connect the dots. I'll help them connect them, but they're going to have the biggest transformations and changes if they can identify that for themselves. Sometimes they might let a bit of clues or lead them in the right direction, but it's really important that they figure that out for themselves yep. and, and be supported around that. Yeah. What have you what like I said, what kind of what what's next for you? Have you have you considered moving back into financial advice full term full full time but but integrating this in in the beginning or you're 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 you know you're you're doing the money coaching thing for the foreseeable future? I loved being a financial advisor, but I just love this more. So I, <laughs> I do like still being authorised and doing the the wealth coach work, which is a part of that digital advice. So I still get to use my technical skills, but 
the rest of my weeks. I do really love this work because I just know how much it impacts someone, someone that's had challenges their whole life around certain blocks around money, to be able to shine a light on what they are and help them grow out of them and discover their full financial potential. Oh, I, it just lights me up. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you yeah. – because it's – it, it, it sounds pretty intense work over over reasonably short periods of time. How do you manage that yourself? Like I was sure it, it, it would have a, a bit of an emotional toll on you, I, I, I would imagine. Like do you have – do you limit how many people you, you work with at a time? And, and if so, what like what does that look like? Yeah, so I'd find it a little bit overwhelming to work with more than 10 people at a yeah. time. So I shift through and people at different stages in that that process that I take them through, but you're definitely right. So uh, I'm quite empathetic. Uh, so I pick up on people's, you know, people like in my office here, I've got tissues and water and there's lots of tears, heal, like crying on the outside, healing on the inside. So it it is quite intense. And some of those sessions that we have, they can go for two hours. Like we oh, really, really kind of delve in, yeah, quite, yeah. quite deeply because you don't want to kind of get to the one hour mark and they're, they've just had some light bulb moment and they're in tears and they're like, oh, now it all makes sense to me. You can't just kind of, well, time's up. So we kind of like have to gently work our way through that. And and that's why I'd be a bit challenged doing that in a financial planning space because you just do need the time and grace to to really support the clients because quite often – those things that they're having trouble with, they didn't have the support or they didn't perceive they had that support growing up. So we really want to kind of nurture them and, and help them through that as they go through the process. Give them, support. Give them the support now that they didn't have. That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, Karen, where can people reach out to you? Where can, where can they find you if they want to know a little bit more? You referenced a couple of resources and things. We'll share some of them in, in, in the show notes. But if people want to know more, where can they find you? Um, I like LinkedIn. That's probably a really good place to find me. I've got lots of, uh, there's a newsletter there. There's lots of different articles that I've written on different aspects of money coaching. So that's probably the best place. Um, okay. LinkedIn, Karen Ailey. Yep. All right. Well, Karen, thank you for joining me this afternoon. Thanks for recording the podcast with me. I know a bit about money, money coaching now. I feel a whole lot better. Well, thank you for sharing with the community, James. It was lovely to chat. Thanks. <laughs>